Hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry we're running a little bit behind, um, but I am so happy to be here today. My name is Ashti, and I'm the founder and CEO of the Global Schools Forum, which is a network of education organizations across Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, and South America. Um, we provide quality education to children from low-income backgrounds. And I am especially honored to welcome you here today to discuss a topic that is incredibly dear to my heart, um, which is education in the midst of crises, and in particular, what that means for women and girls. And to be very honest, I cannot imagine a better panel to discuss this issue with. So let me take just a few minutes to introduce our distinguished panel. Though, um, given that time is limited, I'm very, very barely scratching the surface of everything that these incredible <laughs> women have done. So, starting with my left, um, first we have Dr. Becky Telford. She's the Chief of Education with the UNHCR, which is the UN agency focused on humanitarian conflict and refugees. And Becky is an education specialist with over 20 years of experience in supporting children whose lives have been deeply affected by crisis and conflict. Next, it's my pleasure to welcome Emmy Mahmoud, a two-time world champion poet, goodwill ambassador, and activist. You're a goodwill ambassador for UNHCR, which is brilliant. Um, Emmy's family left Sudan for Yemen in 1994, seeking safety. Mm -hmm. And since then, she has dedicated her life to being an activist and raising awareness around these issues. Um, in 2018, as the founder of the One Girl Walk and Dreams for Peace initiative, Emmy walked a thousand kilometers for peace in 30 days, mobilizing thousands of people along the way. Next, we have Caitlin Barron, who is the founder and CEO of the Luminos Fund, which is an education not-for-profit dedicated to giving the world's most vulnerable out-of-school children a second chance to learn and to change their lives trajectory. I mean, last but not least, we have Muzun Al-Melehan, joining us virtually. Hi, Muzun. Hi, everyone. Muzun is a Syrian refugee, education activist, and goodwill ambassador with UNICEF. She has been campaigning tirelessly for children's right to education in emergencies since she was forced to flee Syria in 2013 with her family. Thank you so much to all four of you for joining us here today. Um, really, unfortunately, because we are pressed for time, we won't have much time for Q&A, but I do urge you um, to stay on and hopefully have a chance to chat with the panelists after we're done. Um, so with that, let's jump in. Um, look, I think all of us in the room probably have a sense of how challenging it is to deliver education in the midst of crises. I think for many of us, indeed, when COVID hit, um, we know that our children and the children that we know were immediately affected. 1.5 billion children were left without schools to attend, and in fact, 168 million of these children are still have lost over a year of school in the process. But crisis and conflict, and indeed protracted crises like the kinds that we're seeing around the world today, um, create a whole set of barriers that go, be go beyond just physical closure. And a lot of these are invisible barriers and carry very hidden costs for women and girls. Um, and indeed, research shows that in times of protracted crises, it's women and girls that, that carry, this, carry the cost and the opportunity gap between boys and girls tends to widen. Um, but today, and in the face of, of these challenges, we wanna do three things. And we want to highlight the role of women leaders, such as those that are here with us today, and of role models. We want to question the stereotypes relating to education and crises through first-hand accounts of former refugees' experiences. And we want to bring forward some effective and inclusive ways of using education to empower girls and women in crisis and conflict situations. And finally, we want to explore how these learnings may be useful for some of the wider global education challenges that we're facing. So with that, let me kick off with a question for the four of you. Um, you know, typically when we think of, of crisis and, and urgent humanitarian situations, we think of security, we think of safety, shelter, access to basic needs. Why? in your experience, is access to education equally important? And is it a basic need? 
who's going to kick us off? <laughs> well, um, I can start. Go I for think it. I'll start with a little play on words. Uh, it, yes, it's a basic need, but it's also a fundamental right. Um, I think it's really important to note that in my, my background is global health, I'm a poet, but one of the first things that we learn is that the highest determinant for the life expectancy of a child is the education level of the mother. Mm -hmm. So how well educated you are can affect how long someone's life is, not only your own, but those of your children and those who follow. So I think if we can start there, you know, education is life and it influences life. And so I think we should have access to it no matter what. You're bringing poetry into it right from the beginning. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Muzun? Thank you so much, mm -hmm. Mazun. And Kaylin, that actually was, um, that's a perfect opportunity actually to talk about Luminos and sort of why you founded an organization that is focused on sort of a second chance, really. We founded Luminos uh, to help the last 59 million children in the world who are still denied the chance to even go to primary school. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing that Mizun and Emmy can speak to better than, than any of us is that if you ask, regardless of what circumstance a mother finds herself in, anywhere in the world, if you ask her what's most important to her, it's the same. Mm -hmm. It's her child's education. And so part of this, you know, in essence, is sort of dragging our feet in the humanitarian community of turning our minds to the challenge of education and emergencies is really a, a failure to listen to mothers. And so we founded Luminos to actually meet mothers and their children where they are, and to work with community-based organizations to train up community teachers to help children rapidly move through an intensive, rich program and curriculum such that they can mainstream in, in schools in their own area and geography. And this is one of the most essential themes of education in emergencies, is yeah. not just how can we meet the child where they are today, but how can we lay the groundwork for their future? Thanks so much, Caitlin. And actually, Becky, I was just wondering from your perspective, given that you've been with um, DFID and UNICEF and you, now UNHCR, um, from the perspective of humanitarian agencies, um, what have been some of the challenges? So as Caitlin was highlighting, um, what have been some of the challenges in delivering education mm -hmm. um, in these kinds of contexts? Yeah. I mean, I think one of the, the challenges for us as the international community is just the scale. I mean, there's, you know, so many people who are displaced. There's nearly 30 million um, refugees, 26.6. And that really is looking at populations who are also displaced for a long time. I mean, you talked about protracted crisis. Yeah. And when we look sometimes at the education and emergencies approaches, they're very much, you know, something very rapid. Um, and, and that's really important, but actually preparing and recognizing that you know, children can spend their entire um, educational life cycle in a refugee camp. And so yeah. being able to put in place something which doesn't just meet needs now, but actually has quality. Um, we find girls particularly drop out at the end of primary school. So I think refugee girls are half as likely as boys to go to secondary school. Mm -hmm. And that then has an impact on you know, how they raise their children and the, the kind of ambitions that they have. So I think just that scale is, is something to be really aware of. Um, and, and being able to deliver 
uh, quality, you know, to have teachers who can really teach, to have teachers who can meet students where they are mm. and understand the additional needs that they have, whether that's, um, you know, coming from a place of trauma um, or needing, you know, additional language support. Some of it's really basic, mm. um, but getting all of those things right is what delivers that quality and kind of makes it meaningful. Yeah, that's really interesting. So the whole the whole context of delivering education in humanitarian, humanitarian crises, we need to change kind of our approach, I suppose. Mm. Um, Emmy, just building on what Becky said, could you maybe speak about from your personal experiences some of the specific challenges either faced by you or some of your friends or peers um, in accessing education? Yeah, um, I can even talk a bit about the, the things that I've seen in the field. Um, yeah. the, so the walk, a thousand kilometers across Sudan, um, we decided, well, I decided that we would stay with people. Uh, just for our safety and different things. And the first place that we stayed in was actually a school that was about 25 kilometers away from uh, Al Fashion, the big main city in Darfur. And it, there was no roof on the school. And so the kids who were with me, they were college students as well, and they were saying they were surprised that so close to a major city, you know, even in Darfur, so close to a major city that they could find a school that has no roof on it. And we have a rainy season and a dry season and things. At the end of the walk, you know, I used my own personal uh, funds for my book to actually put a roof on the school because it was the first thing that we could mobilize after the walk. Um, but what was interesting about it is that when you look at the people on the ground and what they're experiencing, a lot of times there is no visibility or transparency for these things. And I experienced this in the year 2000 when I was in Sudan. And I'm laughing right now because I'm alive, but I was hiding under the beds with four other people. Uh, there were soldiers everywhere. Everything was insane because people went to protest because they had shut the schools down for three months. And I remember being seven years old and afterwards asking my family why we were doing this. And they said it was for education. And you know, it was three years, notably three years before the genocide was officially called a genocide. So before wow. we were even fighting against the genocide, we were already fighting for education. I had to go back home to Philly at the end of that summer, and I was in school, and I had no idea how to even describe what happened. It wasn't in the news anywhere, it wasn't in the TV anywhere, it wasn't in the papers. So visibility is one of the biggest and first challenges. Mm. And then another challenge is just that right, just naming that right. I think that a lot of people don't recognize why it is important to educate people who maybe live in conditions where people might look at it and think, well, you're so disadvantaged, what's education going to do anyway? And that's actually what people have said. Um, the reality is it's the key to upward mobility and even people who have never had access to education recognize and realize that. And that's something that I've seen in interviewing people, um, whether it's anthro interviews or just interviews during my walk. Or what, I've seen it in the camps uh, and I've seen it in my life in every aspect. How do you make it so that where you're born, who you are, what your race is, what your gender is, doesn't determine how far away you can go in life or how long your life is? Yeah. You educate people and you create a world that is not only amenable to others being educated, but is open to people succeeding on every single level. I think everyone in this room will agree that we need to educate girls, and we'll probably agree with everything else that we're saying, but <laughs> when, when you go somewhere else to the other rooms that you're going to be a part of, you know, it's, you find different tiers of bringing people along. Yes, let's educate girls. Okay, people agree with that, but until what level? You know, some people will say until elementary school, some will say till middle school, some will say till high school, some will say yeah. till college. And even people who say till college, they'll say, oh, you wanna do grad school? Well, what about kids? What about family, you know? Th will the same people who invest in girls' education, will they also invest in women's employment initiatives? Will they invest in businesses that women wanna run? Mm -hmm. So that's my big question. Anyway, I could talk about this for hours. The last, <laughs> thing, <laughs> the last thing that I wanna say for now is just that people who are like us, like me or Mizun in Darfur, everywhere else. Um, just like Mizun actually said that it's not just, we don't just need to survive, we need to thrive, and also we need to be well equipped for after the war, because there will be an after the war, there will be a time for people to go back, there will be a time to move on. How do you equip people for an uncertain future? That's the age old question we're trying to answer. Mm. Yeah, I totally agree. I was, yeah, Mizun, I would love to hear from you actually, um, building on what, what Emmy said and what we've heard from Caitlin and, and from Becky. Can you talk a little bit about education and your education sort of shaped you today and in getting you, getting you where you are? 
Um, I know you're currently studying, um, so I would just I would just love to hear from your perspective, sort of how it's shaped you, and specifically, sort of if you think about your gender, um, have you had to face specific challenges on that journey? Thank you, Muzun. Caitlin, with Luminos, um, building on, on some of what we just heard, um, how do you um, work with local partners in the communities where you establish your programs to ensure that they are doing some of these important things that Muzun was talking about? Uh, 
in particular delivering quality education. You talked about sort of gender inclusive classrooms. Just, just how do you engage the community in delivering that? Thank you, Ashdi. You know, Luminos um, across the world um, works exclusively through community-based organizations. And this is because we recognized early on that more often than not, the solutions to the challenges the communities we serve face are, are right there within those communities, waiting for our help and support. Uh, and I recall um, when we were first establishing our program in Lebanon where we work with Syrian refugees. I was meeting with an NGO leader there, leading an amazing science program for girls. And he told me that in, in Syria he was a neuroscientist and here he was working with refugee girls. And he said, this is now the most important work for me to be doing. And so our great privilege at Luminos is to be able to mobilize international support to come in alongside leaders just like that, who know their communities best, who know what they need, and who are really waiting for that international lift to lift them up. That's great, and actually that's a great segue to kind of shift gears um, into the second part of the conversation that I wanted to have with the four of you, which is just exploring sort of some of the lessons that you've learned in your work um, around delivering education in these very complex situations and how maybe we can take some of those lessons and apply them more broadly as we try and um, solve some of the very complex challenges we face in global education. Um, so, so with that, um, Emmy, I was just wondering if you um, could share some of some lessons from your experience um, that you think should inform policymakers mm. um, as they plan and design programs. Well, um, it's funny because I think actually Rebecca touched on it a little bit earlier. A lot of times when we're talking about education in crisis or in conflict, you have to remember that sometimes even when a society falls apart, there are still some constructs that are carried over and it doesn't tend to be the ones that are beneficial. It tends to be, you know, that even in the camps, the girls are still less educated or less valued um, than the guys are and things like that. So what I would want policymakers to keep in mind is essentially that just like in global health when you're trying to convince someone to invest in the health of people who aren't necessarily seen as powerful people, you have to convince them how it's going to affect the GDP. So let's just talk about how the world will be affected if the entire world is educated. Mm. And who is it that we have to educate to make sure the entire world is educated? Girls first and foremost, and um, people in general. So what I would want them to keep in mind is that the success of women does not take away from the success of men or the success of society, but actually contributes to it and only adds to the success of the entire society to all of humanity. And it's really hard to keep that in people's heads to make them understand that the vision of a successful world is one in which women succeed. When you go to different policymakers or parents or teachers, even teachers, if you go to them and you ask them, um, what should girls have? And you go on different levels and start with uh, education or health, you know, should girls be healthy? Most people will say yes, you know. Should girls be educated? You'll lose some people. Should girls be successful? You'll lose more people. Should girls have power? You'll lose even more people. So how do we, how do we get it to a place or get to a society or convince people to go through all those different, different levels of question and get to a point where they say actually, girls and women should be equal on every single level of the spectrum. And that's something that includes addressing biases, inherent biases in your own. So what I would say is start with yourself and start with your family and see what it is that in your own life, what level of equality you allow and how it is that you can broaden that so you can allow it everywhere else as well. <laughs> Thanks. Muzun, let me throw that over to you.
Thanks, Mizun. And actually, since we have the Chief of Education for UNHCR sitting here, <laughs> you can solve all these challenges, Becky, <laughs> in the next five minutes. Easy peasy. <laughs> no, but on a serious note, um, just building on what Mizun said around um, building a model that is potentially more collaborative and that is bringing in voices of former refugees, of refugees, in the design of programs. How does that sort of resonate with you? What is sort of, what is an ideal approach and how are you approaching the design of programs now? Mm. Has it shifted? It's, I mean, I think there's a, there's a couple of pieces to it. So one of the, the things to recognize is like 85% of refugees live in you know, lower and middle income countries. So when you're talking about supporting people to go to school, it's not just looking at refugees by themselves as like a group which are isolated from others. Yeah. It's about saying, you know, where have you found yourself? And how can we help you to arrive here and to be welcome? Mm -hmm. um, and also to you know, support the host community. So, so everyone is able to go to school. And, I mean, we, we really support the inclusion uh, international systems, partly because, you know, we talked about quality education, um, but it's also things like, you know, being able to get a certificate. So it's not just that you go to primary school, but then you can transition, you can go to secondary, you know, you can go to through tertiary education. And I think all the points which have been made around, you know, recognizing yourself, seeing yourself, um, one of the, the kind of biggest determinants of students, particularly girls, going to secondary school is the feeling that they might go to tertiary. You know, they might have an opportunity to do something. And then also having role models in their own community who can say, you know, I, I was there, I was you. This is what I found. And I think, you know, people like Emi and Mazun, they really bring those voices in. And what matters to us as policymakers is how do we listen to them? You know, how do we actually pay attention to what that means? And I think we, we spend a lot of time working on, on designing programs, which is absolutely right. But what always strikes me is how much communities do for themselves. Mm. I mean, during COVID-19, like, we were still you know, in the, head, in the headquarters panicking, being like, how do we respond? How do we respond? And then we knew that actually teachers in Chad were going, you know, house to house and they were getting kids to leave their papers outside and they were putting them in plastic containers so they, yeah. you know, got rid of the disease and then they were marking them and sending them back, you know? People were using loudspeakers to, to do lessons to, to kids who were feeling isolated at home. So I think partly it's just um, really according people the dignity to recognize how much people do for themselves yeah. and then looking at what are the gaps, you know, and how do we come in behind and, and help fill those gaps. That's, that's really amazing. So how do we get those stories that you're talking about that, that work that are community led um, and incorporate them into more sort of global policy and, and programs? Um, Caitlin, what, when we were talking earlier, you mentioned some of the tools and approaches that Lubinos has designed um, over time. Tell us a little bit about that and how they're grounded sort of in, in the solutions or that are developed by communities that you work with. I think that uh, I think that, that Becky's point is absolutely spot on. And if there is one thing that the COVID-19 era has taught international organizations like mine, like UNHCR, is is a, just a powerful reminder yet again of the the potential of communities, the potential of frontline organizations to lead. Um, I know when. Uh, you know, schools around the world shut down in the middle of March 2020. I, you know, I, I sat as the leader of a relatively small but growing NGO with, with schools now closed in Ethiopia and Liberia, et cetera, wondering, you know, what, what will we do? How will we support our students in this moment? And it was my organization's team in Liberia that led the charge. And they said, right, we need to take our curriculum, we need to convert that into workbooks, we need to deliver that door-to-door. -door. Good news, we're already working with community teachers. They're right in the communities where children are, so there's not an issue of coming in and out. And, and I paused and you know, I thought, gosh, how did they know this faster than I did? And you know, of course they said, you know, six years ago with Ebola, our schools were closed overnight for a year. We've seen this all before, right? And, and that is perhaps when I think the most powerful moments of learning and empathy for this global community, right? I, at Luminos, we've advocated for the cause of children out of school for many years now. And I, I used to have to spend quite a good deal of time explaining like, why were children out of school? What did it mean? What, what is lost beyond just learning to read and learning to do maths when a child's not in school? 
Suddenly, every parent everywhere, at least in some small way, has an understanding of what's lost in that moment. And so for all of us to then grab, grab that moment of shared understanding and empathy and lean into it is, is the opportunity we all have before us now. Mm. Couldn't agree with you more. Um, I think we're almost at time, so let me ask a closing question. Um, for all of you, which is um, if you could leave this room with sort of one idea or one innovation that you've seen um, in the field as you've traveled and as you've worked that you think um, is a great solution that can potentially be scaled or that we should remember as we go out there, what might that be? Um, let me ask you, Emmy. Um, actually, what's interesting is it's, uh, it's what you just said that sort of is making me think that this might be my takeaway. So I'm from Philadelphia. I'm from Sudan, but I, Philly's my home. And my youngest brothers are, one just turned 12 and one is 14. And so most of their education experience in the past couple of years has been during COVID. And during the first couple of months, uh, the Philadelphia school districts did something that actually activists we've been advocating for for years. They said, you know, we can't necessarily judge students um, to the same standard based on what their home life might be. We need to make sure that they have access to internet and, you know, uh, what's it called, all the different, the same sort of resources as the other students do at home. And we were like, okay, this is interesting. So they told teachers, don't grade anything. Um, for the first couple of months until we send laptops home to everyone. And it blew my mind because I was like, okay, so it took an entire crisis for people to say that maybe we should make sure that our students' home lives and that they're, you know, that they are equal on every level. So that's something that's sort of an innovation that I hope is carried over even after COVID, that people realize that we need to take care of students not only in the classroom, but also just holistically as an entire person, right? So it was very funny to us. It was good, but it was just really funny to kind of be like, hold on a second. So it took a pandemic <laughs> for you to say, maybe everybody is not necessarily dealing with the same circumstances. And I think that's crucial because it's interesting to see it, uh, or to say it even, that often it's the students under the greatest levels of pressure that end up succeeding the most. Mm -hmm. Imagine if they're doing all of this with this much pressure, you know, and you see incredible things happening in the camps, you see what's coming out of there, the incredible innovation by everyone. Um, you see all of that under pressure. Imagine what they could do if that pressure was taken away and the resources were given. So how is it that we can lift people up so that they're not longer fighting for their lives and get them to a point where they actually can innovate and transform? So level the playing field. Level the playing field, yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much. Mazun, let me give you the, your, the closing words. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, it is like I think we have to start with uh, listening to each other and to listen uh, to everyone who is uh, denied from their lives to go and support them to uh, just understand what they are going through because who have 
Thanks, Musun. What about you, Becky? <laughs> um, I mean, I think it's just the radical idea that everyone matters um, and yeah. that people have a, a right to dream for their own future and building that bright future positively impacts all of us. Mm -hmm. um, I think exactly as, as you were saying, you know, what we found during COVID is that people suddenly were allowing, you know, refugees to work in the healthcare profession. We have a number of, uh, of refugee youth who've been supported through tertiary education mm -hmm. um, and who are now working in health services and they were on the front line of COVID. And there was a real recognition that actually they had a role to play mm. and people were proud of them, you know, and they were kind of welcomed in a way that, that maybe hadn't happened before. Because I think, you know, exactly as you were saying, COVID showed us that you, you can't segregate people in these ways and kind of hope for the best. Um, you know, but building that future collectively means preparing to, to support everyone to play their role in it and, and recognize that value. Thank you, that's great. Caitlin. I guess if there are two particular lessons for education in this moment, it's that first and foremost, what we always knew, learning occurs everywhere and has to occur everywhere. And whether you're in a technology rich environment or a technology scarce environment, we have to find ways that a home environment is as rich a learning uh, community as a school environment. Mm -hmm. So that, I think that's point one. And point two is that you know we've we've always known that the first responders to any crisis were the community itself. Mm -hmm. But you know what we recognize in this moment is that the community itself are also the last responders, right? Mm -hmm. They're the ones who are there all the way through. And so our ability to, to honor that frontline leadership, to support it where it is, to recognize um, the agents of change within the communities we serve is, is just, a, it's just a huge opportunity for us to kind of turn on our head who is saving whom. That's incredibly powerful. Um, I love that you all spoke about the importance of listening to local communities. I mean, that came out so strongly as agents of change, as ways to really fundamentally reshape the world that we live in. Um, so thank you all so much for taking the time. Thank you, Mizun, for joining us. And um, I hope you can stay on and have a chat. Thanks a lot. <laughs>